Good afternoon. It is wonderful to be together for our second in our four-part series with Rachel Korazim, looking at Natan Alterman. Rachel, as I say again and again, is the best teacher of Israeli poetry you will ever have. And so whether you're joining us here in the Zoom or on all our other platforms, welcome. You're in for a treat. Rachel is an ed Jewish education consultant in curriculum development for Israel and the Holocaust education. I met her via the Hartman Institute, the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem, where she was a teacher there uh, and taught incredible poetry about the Holocaust and never forgot her teaching. And so during the pandemic, she created truly an international community of learners, some of who are here with us at Temple Bethel, looking at poetry as the world was winding down, she was winding up and just really was a saving grace to many of us, bringing her insight and her intelligence, her experience as an IDF officer and a member of the IDF delegation to Niger, her vast experience in Jewish education in Israel and around the world, and who also teaches at Pardes and other Jewish communities. And she's just a blessing to have. I also want to share with you it's funny, like we look at what our most valuable possessions are. I didn't show you this last time. This is a book called The Modern Hebrew Poem Itself. I think it's out of print. I got it at like a secondhand shop in Israel. It's my favorite. Israeli poetry speaks to something um, very deeply that the more you study it and the more you reflect on it, the deeper it cuts you. And that is the case today, especially with the silver platter. Um, I'm a very literal and I love concrete and I love um, metaphors to explain things. If you listen carefully and closely to all we're going to discuss today, you will find this metaphor of the silver platter, the most painful and beautiful and powerful metaphor you will have ever heard. Um, it is a reflection of the pain of the Jewish people, the sacrifice we make. And as we sit here and, and our beautiful Israel is again in conflict and tension and pain and we pray for her safety and security again. And it is so ironic we are looking at this today because we wish that the silver platter had been stuck in time at its time and in place. And yet every day, just being a citizen of the land of Israel, there's always the potential to understand the depth here. So um, with no further ado, Rachel, I'm gonna hand things over to you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much for this wonderful introduction, Rabbi. And let me uh, just put everybody on gallery view so I can say hi to everybody who is present on the Zoom. And I know that there must be a few or more than a few other people on the different venues that you are streaming this to. So welcome everybody. This is the second of four sessions relating to a particular chunk of the amazing, huge body of literature left behind by Nathan Alterman. Uh, all the four poems that we will be looking at, uh, the one of last week, the today's, and the two more weeks to come, are taken from a part of the Alterman poetry that we refer to as the seventh column, not to be confused with fifth columns or such. It is just from the time when we still all read printed papers, and printed papers are printed in columns. And Nathan Alterman used to have every Friday on the daily Devar, which was the daily of the Labour Party at the time and the ruling party uh, in a pre-state Jewish population of Israel and for the first uh, 20 odd years into the state. So, uh, or more. So uh, this is just part of his poetry but a very significant part because unlike his lyrical poetry, which I love dearly, this allows a very interesting look into the history of Israel through the poetic lens. And since Alterman had created through the over 30 years that he had written this, over 700 items, uh, it really, covers, I hate the verb covers, it uncovers so many aspects of our life in Israel with this particular a poetic lens. So let me bring up my PowerPoint presentation, 
so that we can start this conversation. And look at the title I gave it, or rather the subtitle. So Nathan Elterman, I introduced already last time, I'll repeat, born in 1910, passed away in the year 1970, did not make his 60th anniversary or birthday. The subtitle, the story behind the birth of an Israeli poetic icon. So I already, already have tagged the silver platter with this medal, if you wish, of an Israeli poetic icon. And indeed, and here is a Rachel Korazim cliche that I have repeated every single time that I taught the silver platter, and there are many. If Israel had a book, a sacred book of secular texts, I know exactly what I'm saying a holy sacred book of secular texts, then the silver platter would be probably chapter one of that book. It is a secular text. We know exactly when it was written, unlike most of our liturgical, a conser conservatively addressed as sacred texts. And yet, in spite of its secular origin, in spite of the fact that we can date it exactly, etc., it is considered in the modern state of Israel as a ritual, iconic text. When we will discuss it, there will be another personality to discuss, and that is Chaim Weizmann, the first president of the state of Israel, who had said a sentence at a certain point, we will uncover that as well. And Alterman picks up that sentence and uses it as the motto of the poem, The Silver Platter. And the sentence said by Chaim Weizmann was, En medina nitenet le'am al magash shil kesef. No state is given to a people on a silver platter. So we are looking at the person who created the iconic motto. We are looking at the image of the person who wrote the silver platter. Let me speak a little bit to the importance of the text from an external source, if you wish. So you can see again the dates for Alterman. And the picture I like to use oftentimes, although there are many Alterman pictures, and that is of him sitting at his desk as the night editor of the Davar Daily. Look at the subtitle of the uh, Davar paper uh, that I gave you just right off Alterman's image. And it says Davar Iton Pole Eros Israel. So the paper of Eros Israel's workers. Note the expression Eretz Yisrael, so we do not yet have a state of Israel, but Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel. But what I really want to draw your attention to is the image on the right hand side, because you know that many countries and probably the United States of America as well can express respect or appreciation of a personality of a historical event by coining a postal you know, stamp. And some people used to collect stamps. I don't think it's done very much nowadays since most of our mail goes electronic. But in the day, one of the ways for a state to express recognition was to create a postal stamp. And you can very e easily imagine that a person such as Alterman would get a stamp. But what I want to show you that this is a stamp in honor of a given poem. This one poem, Magash HaKesef, the silver platter. So it really gives you another way, if you wish, another litmus test by which uh, to appreciate the importance of the text. If you can decipher on the left hand side, which goes like, you know, not, not vertically, the other way, I the word escapes me now, a, up, a, up and down, a, yeah, vertical actually, you can see the dates and it's 2013. So it's actually barely eight years ago. And the poem is much, much, much older. So as late as 2013, still the state of Israel thinks 
that the silver platter composed around the time the state is created is worthy of a stamp. So if you needed any proof, if you did not believe me, I think this one thing may work as a proof. Let us start by me putting the text on the screen and I will add two things before I read it for you for the first time. Being who I am and my age is not a secret, comes October, I'm going to be 75. So that tells you that I have been around when this was created, only a very young child. But as my generation is growing up in Israel, we know this by heart. This was one of the things, one of the poems, such as many biblical texts as well, that we were asked to commit to memory or to learn by heart as the saying went at the time. As per translation, there are many available translations of the silver platter and I did a little bit of a combination. I took one and then I made a few corrections to suit my teaching better. And still there is stuff left in translation. Last comment before I read the Ivrit to you because I need for you to listen to the Ivrit. I would like to ask a Rabbi Jessica, maybe yourself or somebody else who enjoys reading aloud, who would like to follow my Ivrit reading with the reading of the English translation. So if that is the case, will you indicate it to me now? Sure. Aileen, do you, do you want to do that? Is that okay? okay. Aileen? Aileen Fisher will do, okay. the, will do the English. So I'll do the Ivrit and then I'll be calling upon you, Aileen. Thank you very much for volunteering. But she question. lost a, a nephew in the Israeli army. So this is personal. So I'm asking a lot of her. So I, I'm very, wow. Aileen, you know, I love you. So. It comes thank from you. a very real, deep place. Toda, thank you. Very appreciated. Thank you. Magash Kesef, en medina nitenet le'am al magash shel kesef, Chaim Weizman. Vehaaretz tishkot, en shamayim odemet te'amem le'ita al gvulot ha'shenim. Ve'uma ta'amod koruat levach noshemet, le'kabelet ha'nes ha'echad en sheni. He latekes tikon. He takum le mulsahar ve amda terim yom ota hag ve ema. As mineged yis u na arava naar ve at at yis aduhem el mul hauma. Lov sheikol vachagor ve kivdei na alaim banativ ya aluhem haloch ve hachresh. Lo eklifu bigdam lo machod ba maim. את עקבות יום הפרח וליל קו האש. עייפים עד בלי קץ, נזירים ממרגוע, ונוטפים טללי נעורים עבריים. דום השניים ייגשו ועמדו לב לנוע, ואין אות אם חיים הם או אם ירויים. אז תשאל האומה שטופת דמע וקסם, ואמרה, מי אתם? והשניים שוקטים יענו לה, אנחנו מגש הכסף שעליו לך ניתנה מדינת היהודים. כך יאמרו, ונפלו לרגלה עוטפי צל, והשאר יסופר בתולדות ישראל. Aileen, will you lead us with the English translation, please? The silver platter, Nathan Alterman. The state will not be given to the Jewish people on a silver platter, by Chaim Weizmann. And the land will grow still crimson skies dimming, misting, slowly paling again over smoking frontiers as the nation stands up torn at heart, but breathing to receive its unique wonder in 2000 years. As the moment draws near, it will rise darkness facing standing straight in the moonlight in terror and joy, when across from its step out towards it slowly pacing in plain sight of all, a young girl and a boy, dressed in battle gear, dirty, shoes heavy with grime, on the path they will climb up while their lips remain sealed, to change garb, to wipe brow they have not yet found time, still bone weary 
from days and from nights in the field. Full of endless fatigue and all drained of emotion, yet the dew of their youth is still seen on their head. Thus like statues, they stand stiff and still with no motion and no sign that will show if they live or are dead. Then a nation in tears and amazed at this matter will ask, who are you? And the two will say, then say with soft voice, we are the silver platter on which the Jews state was presented today. I, I can't go any further. I can't then see any. I'll do it. Then they fall back in darkness as the day's nation looks and the rest can be found in the history books. Thank you very much, Eileen and Jessica, for the conclusion. We are going to play a full circle and come back to this poem before the end of this session. But I want to point out a few things so that we, we really pay attention to important elements. Look at the beginning and the land will grow still. While the Hebrew said, Ve'ha'aretz tishkot. The tishkot is indeed will grow still and future, but with the beginning of the ve, Ve'ha'aretz, Ve'ha'aretz, this is a biblical grammatical structure that says that it was in the past. Ve'yelech, Ve'yavo means it, he came, he went. So there is a clear confusion about the timing. Is Alterman talking about something that was or something that will be? Indeed, the English translation is true to what we will discover as we look at the secrets, if you wish, or the unraveling of the creation of this poem. Because Alterman, when this is written, is foreseeing in the future a moment when the state, the nation will be ready, standing. Look again at another Jewish element, skies dimming, misting. Is there sunset or sunrise? Both work because for us Jews, days start on sunset. Generally, the day starts in the morning. Is this an intended confusion? This in-between time. Actually, it will be sunset as the Jewish thing goes, okay? The nation is like a person, in Hebrew, a female person is standing there, barely breathing to receive its unique aha. Wonder in 2000 years, that's not the Hebrew. The Hebrew goes, if you can follow the first stanza, Hanes ha'echad en sheni, the unique wonder or miracle with no second. We continue the preparation to the moment of acceptance of receiving, will rise facing the darkness, so indeed it's sunset standing straight in the moonlight and terror, the whole thing happens at night. And now come these two figures, a young girl and a boy. And then a very important, interesting Alterman contrast because we do have poems in the world where you know you have this moment of creation of the state and the people, the military who gave their life, who appear in the picture are supposed to be dressed, you know, for the occasion, not in our case. They are in their fatigues, dirty shoes, heavy with grime, no time to rest, no time to wash, okay, or to change garb. And they are very, very tired, full of endless fatigue and drained of emotion. And then a beautiful Hebrew and other languages expression the dew of their youth is still seen on their head. Remember how young they are in this image. It will play out as we go because they must have been soldiers who gave their life to the state who were not that young. But Alterman wants us to think of the young like statues 
and it's not clear if they are li living or dead. Well, we know symbolically that they are. And now comes a moment again when sometimes when I teach rabbis at Hartman, I will stand, spend a lot of time in something that transpires here in this verse. Then a nation in tears and amazed at this matter will ask, me at him, who are you? Which takes us back to a moment of revelation where Jacob, who is Israel by his name, is encountering for the first time two young people, Ephraim and Menashe, the sons of Joseph, who he had never seen. And Joseph brings them to him and says, Me Ele, who are these like the future, right? And here Altaman picks up on that biblical structure as the nation of Israel is to meet these two unknown young people. They ask, Miatim, who are you in that same biblical structure? And they answer, we are the silver platter on which the Jews' state was presented to you. Those of you who can, please look at the Hebrew of the last line of this one but last verse, where the name of the state is in Hebrew indeed the state of the Jews, the Jews' state. Now, you may ask, and rightfully so, hang on, Rachel, I mean, we know the name of the state, don't we? It's Israel. Altman for sure knows the name of the state. How come he is using the expression, the state of the Jews and not the state of Israel? So since you're not too many on the Zoom, I wonder if one of you would like to guess, why is Altman using the expression, the Jews state and not the state of Israel? Any guess? Okay, so if there is no guess, I will tell you that before we reach the end of this class today, you will be able to understand why Altman, when he writes this, cannot use the expression, the state of Israel. But that's for us to discover together. And let me go back to our PowerPoint and continue this process. Uh, we are at the time immediately following what we call the partition decision. That is November 29th of the year 1947, when the UN takes the decision to divide that British mandate over Palestine between a Jewish state and an Arab state. I have a nice clip here, but I'm looking at my watch and I'm not sure I have the time. So we, maybe if there is time left over at the end, we will look at it. But I trust many of you have seen this clip or similar clips many a time. Lots of celebration, both in America, <laughs> among the Jewish population of the land of Israel, for sure in the DP camps in Europe, and a lot of animosity from the Palestinians who did not accept the partition plan. So this is November 29th, which is a Shabbat, it's a Saturday, when this decision is taken. And the writing of the silver platter is connected to that event. So let me quickly give you a timeline and I will place a few elements on it. So the UN petition, I'm sorry, the dates are written as we write them in Israel. So day first, month next, and then the year. So November 29th, 1947, jump to the next dark blue one, May 15th, May 14th, 1948 is when the state is declared. And then to the right, you have in blue, three phases of the war of independence. We are not going there. Today, these are for other poems written at the time. In between the UN petition decision and the state declared date, I have put an element that may be weird to you. I call it the civil war. So in the different phases of what we call Israel's war of independence, there are the three later ones that are in blue. 
And there is this one that I have placed there for you between November 47 and May 48. Why do we refer to it as the Civil War? Because the Brits are still ruling the land. Both Jews and Palestinians are citizens of the British mandate. They are fighting each other, hence civil war, okay? So this is the phase of the war we want to look at because the silver platter appears at this point, not when the state is born as you would have imagined, but a good six months before. So that's an important thing. Now I took out a Google calendar and looked up the dates of December, 1947, following the petition decision. And you can see like me that in the calendar, what is the most prominent element at the time is Hanukkah. Indeed, that's what happens to Jews in December oftentimes. Let me put the date, Sunday, November 30th, which is just a day before our calendar of December starts. The night before, on November 29th, we had the petition vote. It was on Shabbat at five o'clock in the afternoon, but the same time in Israel is seven hours ahead, and therefore it's after Shabbat and everybody is listening to the news. As soon as the news are known, there is the following morning, beginning of fighting between the Jews and the Arabs, mainly on the control of the roads between urban centers. So as soon as the state is declared, we have the beginning of the fighting. Comes Friday. Comes Friday, it's the time for Alterman Seven's column. I already told you that. And Alterman writes a poem. It is called, And There Was Evening. Don't feel uncomfortable if you never heard about it. Nobody did. This is a poem that Altman intended as his comment on the events of the petition decision. As I told you, the seventh column poetry is all about contemporary affairs. The Sabbath before was this major decision by the UN and Altman reacts in the following Friday with the poem that he thought would be the appropriate one to consider. On the following week, there is no seven column, very unique, very exceptional. And the silver platter will appear only on the 19th of December. So our business today is to discover the why and the how. What happened in these two weeks in the land of Israel in British Mandate Palestine to bring about the creation of the poem, The Silver Platter. We might start with a quote by another famous poet, Chaim Guri, who describes the night after the decision, the partition decision. On the night of the partition plan decision, the last of the party goers met the first one who were killed. This is how close the proximity of events was. People went dancing in the streets of joy for the decision, but the fighting starts immediately. So we want to have that at the back of our mind. Let us look at Alterman and Elaine, if you are good again to do the English, I will enjoy that. If not, I can always read. I'm doing again the Hebrew and you can see at the date, I'm not being pedantic just for being pedantic about the dates. There is a reason. And you remember how I showed you in case, God forbid, you should forget that Hanukkah is in December. I want you to have Hanukkah at the back of your mind as Alterman does, because the first candle lighting will be on the following Mutzai Shabbat immediately after he publishes this on Friday. So he has that in mind. V'anshei medinat ha-Yehudim az machu b'lechiam, milechiam b'sharvul, et dimat ha-simcha en edim, v'yudu le-Elohei ha-gmul. 
ויברכו איש אחיו בדברים מעטים, ויפנו אל עמדות הגבול. ויהי ערב ושוב כמתמול, אין ירח עמדה צופה, וחייכה על ביון בלי קול, וערב סכינה שלפה, והכל כמאז, אך שונה כה הכל, יען רוח אחד חלפה. That will do for the Hebrew. Do I have an English reader or shall I do it? I'll do it. Thank you, Elaine. <clears throat> And it was evening, Natan Alterman, November 30th, 1947. And the people of the Jewish state wipe off their cheek with their sleeve, a witness's tear of joy and had praised the God of reward. They congratulated each other with few words and turned to the border posts. And it was evening like yesterday. The moon's eyes stood watching and Albion smiled soundlessly as Arabia pulled out its knife. And everything is as it had always been, yet everything had become so different as a unique wind Ruach had passed. Do you want me to keep going? Yes, please. Since the Ruach of the awesome day hit the Jews like a sea and dropped in their lap the news like a warm newborn. And all as before, just a white crib came to be in the nation's heart. And when the fires leaped to the roof, To threaten with fear, they joined the holiday's candles in the poor home of a generation on its forehead, brightly shining the inscription of life and freedom. Thank you so much for this lovely reading. And let us go slowly, because had not a turn of events brought, bring about the creation of the silver platter, This would be our iconic poem to mark the day when the world decides that the Jews are deserving of a state. And it had disappeared into oblivion because of the silver platter. So let's give it at least five minutes of our attention, posthumously, if you wish. And the people of the Jewish state, voila! Of course he calls it the Jewish state or the Medinata Yehudim. because this is November 30th, 47. The declaration of the state by Ben-Gurion will happen in May of 1948. This is when the name is chosen. Altman doesn't know what the name will be. And for the lack of any other choice, he goes to the obvious. <coughs> Medinata Yehudim, the Jewish state, or the state of the Jews rather, is the title of the famous Herzl book, Altneuland, okay? The, uh, sorry, Judenstadt, the Jewish state. And therefore, because he has no other name, he uses the name coined by Herzl many over 40 some years before this poem is written. So the people of the only name I can call you my state for now, with their cheeks, with their sleeve, a witness of a witness the tear of joy and had praised the god of reward look at the hebrew elohe hagmul gomel we call birkat hagomel the blessing that we say when we have been saved of a disaster and ultimate chooses to incorporate this word, Elohei Hagmul, God who brings about an award, a reward, as the prayer or the thing they were thankful for. They were actually saying Hagomel, think very clearly, if, and for a good reason, a poor cause, as the French would say. I mean, this is barely three years after the Holocaust. They have survived, they are here. So they congratulated each other with few words. Yes, we often say that about the Palmachniks of the time that they were not very unspoken and went on their business and turned to the border post. This was no time for celebration. And it was evening, like the biblical form again, Alterman will always turn to the Tanakh 
and it was evening like yesterday, the moon I stood watching, Albion, that's Britain, smiled soundlessly. They never trusted that the state will come into being. Arabia pulled out a knife and everything as it had always been, yet everything had become so different as unique was wind in Hebrew or ruach like spirit. Since the ruach wind slash spirit of an awesome day hit the Jews like a sea and dropped in their lap the nose like a warm newborn. Hang on for a moment with me. 10 minutes ago or less, Elaine read to us the silver platter in which the silver platter on which the state is given, the metaphor for the state are two young fighting people, upright, strong, weary. But in this earlier poem, Alterman uses a metaphor of a very vulnerable newborn, not the strong soldier who is ready to give their life, but somebody that needs protection. And all as before, just a white crib came to be in the nation's heart. The state to be born is a baby. It's vulnerable. And when the fires leap to the roof because they were shooting on that, I mean, there is a whole week between when, a, when, when this would be published, right? He writes it the, sec the next day, but immediately the fighting and the fire started. And when the fires leaped to the roof to threaten with fear, they joined the holiday candles. It's Hanukkah. As the fires erupt throughout the country, the candles are lit every night in the poor home of a generation on its forehead rightly shining the inscription of life and freedom. Please remember that now, since May of 1948, we have the Day of Independence, Yom Atzimot, that we celebrate both in Israel and outside of Israel. But we are before that. This is November of 1947. The state was not yet declared. No Yom Atzimot. And prior to the state, the holiday in which especially the Jews living in the land of Israel, Hayishuv, as they were referred to, for them, Hanukkah was the holiday in which you celebrate freedom from an oak of foreigners, a sovereignty and such. So Hanukkah is still the in loco, if you wish, of Yom Ma'ut of the day of independence to come. This is the first poem and Alterman writes to mark the event of the petition decision. And we know when it was published, okay? Now here is what happens on the coming days. I will just read to you a little bit and then I will highlight a part. 14 days had passed from the publication of And There Was Evening to the publication of The Silver Platter. In those days, the violent act grew and it became clear that the state that had not yet been born is on a threshold of existential war. And I am just highlighting the lower part. All the way down to this is just the enumeration of all the victims. Next to the list of names, another black framed list of all those who were killed throughout the country on the previous day. By December 18th, which is the date when the silver platter is written, the number of the dead had reached 120. We are reading from the book, the biography of Alterman, uh, created by Professor Dan Laor of Tel Aviv University about 11 years ago. For me, like, you know, a handbook in all my studies and research. Let me make this clear. 120 people, Jewish people, were killed between December 1st and 18th. Now, this is a tremendous number. God forbid it should happen today. Just remember a week ago how, how heartbroken we were for the 45, how our heart bleeds for the two women killed in Ashdod today. 120 in a matter of under three weeks. And out of how many? 
When Ben-Gurion declares the state of Israel, there are 600,000 Jews living here. This is six months before new immigrants are still coming in. So they are probably half a million. And out of that 120, do you want to calculate the percentage? Would you want Hasle Khalila, God forbid, to calculate what that would mean? Relatively today, we don't even want to go there. The devastation is terrible in these pre-state early, pre early days. Of the many devastating battles taking place in those two weeks, we shall focus on a battle of Shu'ut. It is probably the one capturing the spirit of the day. So again, if you have no idea what the battle of Shu'ut was, it's fine. Very few people know. It's somewhere in the Negev, and there is this beautiful memorial that you can make a point of visiting once when you come to Israel. Let me tell you a story. Here's the map. I know it's all in Hebrew, but in, an, in the Negev, a water pipeline is laid between Be'er Sheva and 11 new kibbutzim. It needs to be protected daily against Arab attacks. So the turquoise line is the line of the water pipeline. And I'm giving you a few, you know, like things to hang on to. Where is Be'er Sheva? Where is the Mediterranean? You can see easily. And I gave you the name of two kibbutzim along this line. There are 11. But we are looking at the section between Kibbutz Gvulot and Kibbutz Mirim. Between every two kibbutzim, there is Palmach unit. Palmach is the combat part of the Haganah, the clandestine to the Brits illegal defense organization that was created in the state. There were two others in the pre-state years. And you can note in this picture, even though it's not very clear, that among the many guys, there is a woman standing in the middle, just one, okay? This is a true picture of what we are talking about. We will be talking about this section of the pipeline between Gvulot and Nirim that this particular unit is protecting. So small Palmach units are placed in the different kibbutzim and they patrol the line to assure the water supply of every one of these kibbutzim. On December 9th of 1947, you can note the Hebrew date is through during Hanukkah. It's Kafzain Kislev and Hanukkah starts on Kafhei. A small, the small protecting unit of the Palmach members are patrolling inadvertently they enter the town of Shuot, an Arab village, and they are attacked. There are nine of them, only three survive. The commander is Asaf Shechnai, and the only woman we have seen was Miriam Shechel. Asaf chooses two people to stay with him and hold the attackers back, and he commands the other six to retreat to the kibbutz. Three make it, three do not. Six had fallen in battle between Gvulot and Nirim. And the memorial created at this place, I can read you the Hebrew, So at this place, on that day of Hanukkah were fallen the first fighters for the defense of the Negev, the southern part of Israel. And you can see that while in memorials, we normally list the victims alphabetically, that here we have on top Asaf Shachnai, the commander for this act of bravery that he had commanded, staying behind, protecting the others, and Miriam Shechor, the only woman who participated in this battle. Will you please note their date of birth? Both of them, both of them were a couple of days before their birthdays. None of them had reached the age of 20. Okay, you can see that from the dates. 
Miriam Shachor was engaged to be married. Okay, so here is the detail of what I just told you. Let's go back to our calendar. So this is the Battle of Shu'ut. And this is the Shu'ut funeral. So I think it's crystal clear why Alterman is not publishing the seventh column that Friday. The state is in really a, I would say, depressed mood, in fear of where this is going, 120 victims in two weeks or so, and of the top of that, the Battle of Sha'ut. But you and Jews can maybe mark another thing, and that is the discrepancy between the date of the battle and the time they were killed and the funeral. This is way too long according to Jewish custom. So this is also an indication of who knows when did Jewish people get access to the bodies? Who knows what state they were found in? What intervention of the Brits, maybe the chief rabbis was needed in order to finally make the funerals possible on Friday. They were all buried together in Tel Aviv. And this can explain, as I just said. And now we are looking at Alterman. Probably, I mean, all of Tel Aviv was there. All of Tel Aviv was there. I actually managed to meet one person since I started teaching this who attended this funeral. And indeed, he, he told me a little bit about the ambiance. Miriam Shechor was a member of the Bnei Akiva, the modern Orthodox youth movement. And therefore everybody from Bnei Akiva in the Tel Aviv area and the rest of the country came to the funeral. Her father was a well-known teacher and he was given the honor, the painful honor to eulogize all of them. I was heard if that Chaim Guri was asked about this funeral, the poet that I have quoted at the beginning. Uh, he, was, uh, he was present at the funeral and he was asked whether Alterman was. And he said, listen, I didn't see him, but that doesn't mean a thing because I cannot imagine that he wouldn't be there. So let's imagine that Alterman is there and he is taking notes of the eulogies, of the atmosphere, of everything that he sees. And this is a Friday and he comes back to his office Saturday night because he is the night editor and he has to look at what he has. So uh, let me read just the English. A shudder ran through the huge gathering when the teacher, Miriam Shachar's father, Miriam Shachar's father, stood up to deliver his eulogy in all of the bereaved parents' names. I'm not here to eulogize, nor to shed tears, he had said. I come to encourage. I call upon the youth to enroll and fill up the ranks. My beloved Miriam was privileged to fall as a hero on the holy soil and to sanctify the soil of the Negev. We, the parents, are privileged to know we have raised sons who knew how to protect the homeland. The people of Israel will rise and build its state. This is the father. I can see Altima standing there and taking notes, or maybe just visiting the bereaved home before Shabbat and asking the father for the notes. Who knows? And then as he is doing his duties as his night editor, he has also another text by the chief editor of the VAR. And you can see on the right hand side, the Mem Dalet under the, the, the title is Dvar Hayom, which is the, the word of the day. And underneath you can see the letters Mem Dalet, we stand for Ma'arechet Dvar. So it's the VAR editorial, and that was always written by the chief, the editor-in-chief, who is Zalman Shazar, later the third a president of the state of Israel. We are reading just a little bit. We have accompanied you, as we are doing now every day. 
the battle had only started and its phases and end cannot yet be seen. In your death, you are emerging out of the underground and the world knows these are the pioneer soldiers of the uniformless army of the people army who stand ready for order in their daily toil. Can you already hear the silver platter being born? Out of the words of a very talented writer, the chief editor of the Var Zalman Shazar, as I said later, the third president of the state of Israel. So between the words of the eulogy and the summing up of the chief editor, by the way, I have sent you all these texts in a source sheets that I trust were forwarded to you or will be made it's, available. It's, it's on the link. I'll, I'll put it in, okay. in the chat. So can I make, can, can I yeah. say one thing about this letter? So as I told you, Aileen lost her nephew um, on Yom Kippur. Um, how many years ago now, Aileen? Um, oh, the Yom Kippur was and, No, no, it wasn't Yom Kippur. He was, it was on the, it was on the 30th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War, right. I think, or, okay. um, but there's a poem her sister read at his Azkara, the Mayor Shalev poem. Um, um, and and, and that line, the place of your death is never far from your home. And that's mm -hmm. here too. Like, I think that just, you know, the American wars we fight are often far away, yeah, not on our soil. World. And already this concept, the state is a baby and already they are knowing that where they're going to die is going to be down the street from where they live. It's very mm -hmm. foreboding. Thank sorry. you. Thank yeah. you. Right. No, don't be sorry. It's important. So here's Alterman with these two texts and you can see already this other poem, this need to rise to the event because the people is devastated and somebody needs to collect all his talent and say, it will be over. We will make it happen. So this is the editor in chief. And if you take a moment to read these texts, you will see the beginning of the silver platter. And now comes the big question. Where and when did Weizmann say this sentence? No state is given to a people on a silver platter. And Mordechai Naor, another historian of Alterman and historian of the different poems of the silver platter tells in an interview on Israeli television that he was researching and looking and went all the way to the Weizmann archives in the Weizmann Institute where the librarian made fun of him by saying, you two, everybody is looking. We never found it. We have no idea. Leave it be. We don't know when he said it. He said it. But Nahor <laughs> was persistent. And he says in this interview, but I knew my Alterman. He said, Alterman was not a reader of great articles and historical texts written by Weizmann. Alterman was a journalist. He was reading papers and he decided to look at the papers preceding the writing of the silver platter. So this is Naor and his book about the silver, uh, the seventh column, which he calls the eighth column. And that's his book accompanying the, uh, as a, as a company reader when you study the seventh column. And he says that in the New York Times on December 15th, 1947, there was an event, mind you, a fundraising event in Atlantic City. Weizmann was in the States for the UN petition decision. Jewish federations who knew that there must be fundraising for this nascent tax state probably asked him to stay a few more days for the banquet and deliver the keynote as the kicking off of the fundraiser. And it's Dr. Weizmann emphasized that no state has been handed to us on a silver platter and that only the opportunity to build a state has been created by the nations of the world, okay? On December 15th, this is quoted 
by Haaretz, mind you, not Davar, not Alterman's Davar, but another Israeli daily. And if we do not make the most of that chance, we shall miss our rendezvous with history, he warned. And Alterman, as a night editor of one paper, for sure sees the other paper as well. So now we can put everything together. The UJA fundraising event in Atlantic City happens on May, on December 13th. The papers will show it on the 14th. Here is the New York Times. Here is Haaretz quoting it on the 14th. We now have the three days between December 15th and December 19th when the poem is published. This is the birth of a national icon. This, these are the days when Alterman needs or understands the need to stay, stand out there and speak to the people and tell them it will be over. And the land will grow still, crimson skies dimming, misting slowly, paling against over smoking frontiers. As the nation stands up, torn at heart, but breathing to receive its unique wonder in 2000 years. And if you go to the bottom, then the nation in tears and amazed at this matter will ask, who are you? And the two will then say with soft voice, we are the silver platter on which the Jew state was presented today. Then they will fall back in darkness as the day's nation looks and the rust can be found in the history books. So ladies and gentlemen, this indeed is the story behind this unique piece of literature. And it is not dead because you can even see graffiti as somebody sent me about a year ago uh, that they found and took a picture of in Jerusalem. On it, it says, I want Alterman to come with his silver platter with meaning placed on it. So I would say that the thirst, huh, where did I lose you? Here I am. Okay, I would like to conclude by saying that although it is, as I have said, an iconic poem, although oftentimes recited at memorials, I think it has very good reasons to go more deeply behind the scenes and figure out how a poem like this comes into being. I think I'm done here at this moment and it's over to you, Rabbi, if you sure. see any questions in the chat or right. you yourself. Yeah. I have some comments and then please put questions in the chat. So two things from an American perspective, and this is when you read about the UN vote, it was Thanksgiving on Thursday. And so it was going to be really hard. Like the vote was almost lost because people weren't interested in coming back to, for this vote for this nation they didn't even care about after Thanksgiving, like Thanksgiving is a big, so when you're talking about Hanukkah, so it's funny to me to think about Weitzman spending Thanksgiving in America and then, and then Hanukkah and all these other things that played in. That's one that came to mind. The other thing I think that comes to mind is that, and this is why I love what you do. So it's like when someone rears a Korea ribbon, you know that they had a specific loss and that's their loss, but we know all of us experience loss. And in these poems that I thought of it with the there was evening line where he talks about the fire of the happy fire, the fire of Hanukkah and the destructive fire, the fire of war coming together. And I think yeah. what is so beautiful about the way you teach is you get in like the pratim, the details, because like, yes, there's fire everywhere, but you explain this fire and you explain that fire. And I was only prompted to think this because, you know, as I've mentioned, Aileen's nephew is like a beloved person and like I've dedicated my life to telling a story as his family and there's a documentary about him and like there are many losses but once you put the face on her loss or on the loss of this father and his daughter it it just makes it so much more so it's not just only knowing Hebrew that makes the poetry come alive it's knowing all the these minute details and Rachel like that's what you do for I think us like so much it's like you get into every nook and cranny of the poem so all of a sudden you've created a picture of an event or a person um that that we didn't have before because our history is you know we're sitting today and 
you know, Israel's in a hotbed today and it doesn't end, but, but if you understand and, and reflect on the beautiful people that made the sacrifices then and the people that make the sacrifices now and just the complexity of what it means to be a Jew in the world and just the fire with the fire is what kind of prompted mm. me. I'm just going to look in the chat um, or you can and, and have a, a wonderful well, session. Roberta, hey, Bobby, Bobby. I just want to say this is the third time I've heard you teach this poem. And every time I hear it, I get more and more out of it. So thank you. Yeah. This well, is selfish because she did this session here. And like, I love this. I love journalism. I love her teaching. I love poetry and Israeli poetry. And yeah, so you did this. That I'm the same way, Bobby. I just, every time you teach it, Rachel, like something else sticks. I try. And it's just amazing. All right. We will see you. Do you next week? Um, mm -hmm. I'm looking if I have the, the, the session title. It's on the, it's and on the um, ethics. It's about it's, war ethics. Yes. Yes. War ethics and the need. Call it misdeeds, misdeeds even when the fighting goes on, mm -hmm. for sure. Much love. Please stay safe. Our prayers are with you and the Good state of Israel. Thank, thank, you. thank you to thank everyone. You. And we'll see you. Thank you, Kira and Sharon. I think are both with us producing today. Thank you to both of you and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Mm -hmm.